Okay, so I just want to set a little bit of the backstory of what's happening with the Gambinos. So in 1995, uh, Paul Castellano is boss and John Gotti ends up killing him, you know, with Sammy mm -hmm. the Bull, who was involved in it. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed mm -hmm. Sammy. We talked about this whole situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1987, uh, Gotti gets charged for a whole bunch of crimes, but he gets acquitted. This is where the whole Teflon Don mm -hmm. uh, situation, you know, the name starts to arise. Now, at the point where the Gambinos start to kind of cozy up to you, when do you meet John Gotti? Well, what happened was, um, so Gotti took over when I was a kid. I was still robbing cars and starting to hijack trucks maybe when Gotti starts taking over. Uh, at some point or another, I met somebody who was in that family, in John's family, uh, and I ended up Basically, uh, you know, slowly but surely, I was meeting, I should say, first of all, I should say, I was meeting a lot of guys on the street who all wanted to put a claim on me because I was making money. You know, each family puts a claim on somebody, but you have to have, you have to want to be with that family too. So I was meeting older guys. Some of them might've been full of shit. Some of them might've been real. Some of them I liked, some of them I didn't. And at some point or another, uh, I did meet a couple of guys that brought me around the neighborhood. And I ended up, uh, for the better part of six or seven years, my telephone toll records went back and forth to Peter Gotti's house. Peter Gotti being John Gotti's oldest brother, who was also a captain in the family and eventually became the boss of the family for a little while. Um, so I was in and out of his house for the better part of six or seven years every day. I became very close with Pete's son, uh, Peter. Um, and through Peter and Pete, I met... Probably most of the guys, uh, I became very close with Joe Butch's stepson, Joe Butch Correo. He was a big capo in Little Italy. Uh, Jackie knows his stepson, Jackie knows the Miko. Um, there was a few guys that I became very close with, and they became my dear friends. Uh, and then I also had my crew, separate and aside from the mob guys, I had my crew from my own neighborhood in Flushing, Queens. These were the guys I grew up with. Those were the guys we robbed with, me and my friends. These, those are the guys, when the FBI eventually closed in on me, they said I headed up a crew of armed robbers within the Gambino crime family. Those guys were my crew, the guys I grew up with, the guys I could trust and count on with my life in a hot second. You know, they, 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 would, they would give their life or take a life because that's the way we thought back then, you know, for each other. Now, weren't you told to stay away from Sammy the Bull? Yeah, it's an interesting story. I was at, I was at a vacation, uh, a horse ranch with Joe Butch Correo, Peter Gotti, and Joe Butcher's stepson, uh, Joey Boy, great guy. Uh, and I remember Sammy had just become either the underboss or the consigliere. And I was just sitting at a picnic table at this horse ranch. And I said to Joe Butch, I said, uh, how's Sammy? And Joe Butch turned around and he gave me a look. And he, he, he gazed at, he glared at me. And I took, I took the look as stay away from Sammy, but I didn't, I didn't understand it to be Sammy was a rat. That was the furthest thing from my mind. What I did understand it to be was, Sammy might be a little treacherous, watch your step with him. And I did understand as I went forward and Sammy became more and more of a prominent guy in our world, you know, because before that he was just a guy in Brooklyn. You know, then they take over the family, Sammy eventually becomes a capo, then the consigliere, then the underboss. It all happened with lightning speed. Obviously a mistake now that, that was made to, to promote him that quickly. No one should have fast-tracked him, but whatever the case was, it happened fast. So now I'm learning more and more about him, and I'm hearing he clipped this one who was a friend of his. He clipped the other one who was a friend of his. He was very treacherous. So I figured that was what the gaze that Joe Butch gave me was about. Years later, while I'm researching for my book that I just came out with, Borgata, the Borgata Trilogy, which is a history of the American Mafia beginning in Sicily and up and through my own time, um, I learned that Joe Butch had inside information that Sammy was already bad, that Sammy was a rat. And he had approached John about that and told John Gotti, hey, Sammy's a rat. And John decided to dismiss Joe Butch's warning. And I, I cover this thoroughly in my book um, in volume three of the Borgata trilogy, which isn't out yet. Volume one is coming out now. Uh, but I did cover it thoroughly and I got some inside information in there from people I spoke with who were involved, who were privy, who were in the know uh, when that all took place and why John dismissed it, why John didn't want to hear it, why John didn't move on it, why John didn't clip Sammy, which he should have. Joe Butch never lied. If Joe Butch had information, it was coming from a good source. I'm not sure why in the beginning, but I did learn why John dismissed it eventually, but he shouldn't have. So yeah, so that's sort of my experience. Um, first time I mentioned Sammy, 
I knew to stay away from him. Uh, and that was basically how, how, you know, I thought it was because he was treacherous. I didn't know that Joe Butch knew already that he, he was a rat. And I don't know what he ratted on, by the way, back then that Joe Butch had information about. But Joe Butch wasn't known to give false information. Joe Butch went away, went to prison eventually for having inside people giving him verified information. So if Joe Butch had verified information, then and it's proven in a court of law that he had all information that was good, why was his information about Sammy bad? Doesn't make sense. So there is something that Joe Butch knew that he told John about, and John decided to, to, to disregard to his own detriment and the detriment of the entire Gambino family. Well, right, because in 1990, the FBI raids uh, Gotti's Ravenite Social Club. Mm -hmm. uh, Gotti gets charged with five murders. Mm -hmm. And a year later, in 1991, Sammy the Bull cooperates. Mm -hmm. He admits to 19 murders, and he ties John Gotti to four out of the five murders that he's charged with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By 1992, Gotti gets sentenced to life without parole. Now, did you have a relationship with John Gotti during this time? I did not have a close relationship with John because he was the boss. I mean, you see John on the, you see John in front of the Bergen. You see John, you know, I didn't go to the Ravenite uh, a lot. If I ever went there, I was passing by. Uh, so you'd see John in front of the Bergen. Most of the time I went to the side club, which was John Gotti Jr.'s club, uh, who I, you know, obviously knew. Um, but I was close with Pete. John, you know, Pete was John's oldest brother. I reported to Pete if I had an issue with beef on the street. I went to Pete. Pete took care of it for me. Uh, you know, Pete was my, uh, you know, my goomba. So basically, uh, that's who you deal with. Uh, you know, and I dealt with other people on the street too. But John was removed. John was the boss. I mean, John's, you know, top dog. Even if you're a capo, you're not just going to go, hey, John, I, you know, I want to see you today. You know, you got to make an appointment. You got to go see the boss. You know, when it comes, you know, he'll, he'll, he sends for you. He calls you in. So it's a little bit different. Um, you know, it's just, you know, I was down here. John was at the very top. And I'm doing my own thing. I'm robbing army cars. I don't know if John wants a guy who's, you know, robbed an army car around, you know, yesterday, hanging out next to him today. Yeah, I don't know if that would have been the best look either. Well, did you have a relationship with Chin Gigante? Yeah, I, it's, it's an interesting relationship. So I became very close with Chin's family. Uh, Chin's, uh, Chin's wife, Olympia, he had two wives, both named Olympia. But the first wife, the real law wife, legal wife, Olympia was, was a dear friend of mine. I have a picture of me and her on my website. I actually also have a picture of me and Peter Gotti on my website uh, and Ronnie Gialonzo, who was a dear friend of mine. Um, but uh, there's a picture of me and Olympia Gigante on, on, uh, on my website. Olympia wanted to see me when I came home from jail. And before I went to jail, I was very close with her and her daughter, Rita. Um, I love them to this day. Obviously, uh, Olympia's passed away. Uh, she's moved on to hopefully a better world, better, you know, more peace. But Rita's still around. But um, the Gigantes, I practically lived in their house, went there for weekends. Um, now, Chin lived with his mother in the village, just to be clear. Chin lived with his mother in Greenwich Village, uh, I think Houston Street. He lived in an old shabby apartment with his mother. Uh, and now Chin's family, his first family, lived in Old Tapan, New Jersey at the time. And that's where I used to stay. I used to stay in Old Tapan. Now, on, if I went there on a Friday night and I stayed till Sunday morning, I would typically drive Rita and her mother to the uh, to the bridge, to the George Washington Bridge, and this I'll tell you how I'll tell you how Chin Gigante was so he was so low key and so different from the rest of us at the time. And here's an example: when I would drop Rita and Olympia off at at the George Washington Bridge, a little old man would pull up in an old beat up four door car with white wall tires. It was totally out of style, and he would be driving like a little old man. And he'd get out of the car and I'd shake his hand and I'd make the, the hand off. Rita and Olympia would get in the car and then I'd peel by him with either my Mercedes or whatever I was driving, a Corvette convertible. And I'd tap the horn and he'd give a little wave and I'd go on my way, head home, back to Queens, back to my own crew in, in Queens too, uh, which Chin found out about later. He didn't know all the time in the beginning. So this guy who ended up picking me up taken Olympia and Rita from me, his name was Bruce. And I only knew him as old man Bruce. And he had like a little wet fish handshake, nothing strenuous, you know, not a strong guy. I didn't see him as that. Years later, years later, I'm in prison. And somebody was talking about in the row, we, I was with Joe Watts and a couple of guys, Little Vic Arena, and they were talking about how the late Bruce Palmieri died, Chin's guy, 
So I said, Bruce Palmieri, let me see. And he showed me a picture of him. And I said, son of a bitch, that's Bruce, the old man. I had no idea. He was a captain in the Genovese family. In a million years, you would have never guessed that. You would have gave him a bowl of soup if you saw him and felt bad for him. That's how low-key his guys were. Driving an old shit box, low-key, nice, you know, very easy-matted, soft-spoken. And meanwhile, he's a captain in that family. And here I am flying around the world. You know, we were the new generation. And I'm ashamed to say that, but we were like more like the Goodfellas generation, where he might have been more like the Godfather generation. You know, making the distinction between movies, that is. Well, yeah. I mean, Chin Gigante was essentially arch enemies with John Gotti. Yes. Because when he... after Gotti killed Frank, mm -hmm. um, that was a big problem. I mm -hmm. mean, it was an unsanctioned hit of a right. boss. Right. And Chin had a relationship with Frank. So, right. you know, was there a problem of you yes, a little. associating yes. with the Gottis yes. as well as Chin Gigante? Yep. So at some point, I let Peter Gotti know that I stay by Chin's house on the weekends because my friends obviously want to know why I disappear for the weekend. You know, you can only, you know, sometimes I go take a girl away, but, you know, I'm disappearing all the time. So you want to tell your friends where you are. So I let, I let my friends know I'm in Chin's house in Old Japan. Uh, now, Chin eventually found out on his own and went ballistic because he did not want somebody from the Gambino family in his house with his wife, with his kids, it went ballistic. So we called Rita down to the city. Rita went to see him and he says, get this guy out of my house. And she said, she had, Rita was, the, first of all, a beautiful person, but second of all, tough like, tough like a man. She had her father's balls. And she said to him, you pick your friends, I'll pick mine. That's my friend. I ain't going against him, I ain't giving him up. It's my friend. So she stood up for me. Uh, so I, you know, I said to her, he ain't going to clip you. He's going to clip me. So I started watching if I went there, watching if I left. You know, I had fun in the house. Don't get me wrong. I put on his robe and walk around the house. But Rita was a doll and, and Olympia was a doll. And they, they stood by me as friends. And they were with me all through my prison sentence, by the way, too. They always stood by me when I was in prison. They were there for me when I was away um, against the father's wishes against his wishes because they were sort of like a cold war. It wasn't like an out and out war they ever had. Both men knew, you know, not to try the other. But at one point, Chin did want to clip John and it was picked up on, uh, it was picked up on tape. And then the FBI took that uh, tape to John and said, listen, we have information that the Chin's looking to clip you. And John said, yeah, I don't believe it, whatever. But John obviously knew it was true. And then John sent word to the Chin. And I, as I understand it, there was sort of like a, like a Cold War detente type thing between the two of them, where each man knew, look, if you know if something happens to the other, we're going to end up in a war. It's like the Russians and uh, the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War. Do we really want to have our hands on the button this whole time? So they kind of backed off a little, but he did not want me in his house. Okay, so we talk about the mafia. I mean, the main focus is to make money mm -hmm. illegally most mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. But... There's also a part of the mafia that's very violent, mm -hmm. and you have the hitmen mm -hmm. that are part of this organization. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, Sammy the Bull, who, like I said, admitted to 19 murders, mm -hmm. but there's a whole bunch of guys that were floating around. Mm -hmm. um, Roy DeMeo was mm -hmm. an absolute nightmare, mm -hmm. um, and there was a guy that you knew that did something really hideous with a blowtorch. Uh, yeah, well, are you talking about Richie Pagliarulo? Little, a little, I think so, yeah. Yeah, well, I got close with Richie. Uh, I got really close with Richie in the penitentiary. Uh, Richie, Richie walked the yard with me and gave me a big hug and a kiss before I left the Lewisburg penitentiary years later. I, I think that's who you're talking about. Richie supposedly was allegedly blowtorched somebody that he killed. Uh, oh, Gas Pipe was another one. I was never close with Gas Pipe, though, but Gas Pipe blowtorched somebody. You know, the Lucchese family had a little bit of a reputation for taking a blowtorch to people's elbows and knees. Um, there was a lot of violence. Uh, me personally, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I hear all these rats when they go bad and they're all, and I never ratted by the way. I never snitched. I refused. I faced the rest of my life in prison. I figured if I have to die in there, I'll die in there. Anything short of that is a gift. And, and I'm here living the gift. Thank God I'm here to, you know, enjoying it. But I did think that I would never get out of prison at one point. And now I listen to all these rats who killed a million people and I don't know I couldn't find that many reasons to kill everybody unless you really, really just want to kill. Because I felt like the mafia should be about making money 
And if you have to defend yourself or you have to move on somebody, then that's part two. So I understand it. I understand that people got to go for some reasons. But I also thought I was a little naive before I went to prison. I thought if somebody disappeared, they did something wrong. They went, you know, if you commit treason against the United States and you're executed, okay, you committed treason against the United States. You sold nuclear secrets or something. You got to go. That's the laws of your country. So I understood the laws of the mafia to be if you go against the family, there are certain rules. If you do something, you got to go. So if a guy would disappear, I would just automatically assume the guy disappeared for a good reason and you don't ask about it. You just automatically assume there are people at the top who know that this guy did something really, really bad against the Borgata, against the family, and he had to go. I'm in jail and I'm hanging out with everybody and I'm starting to realize that all the guy, all the murders they're all charged with, I'm going, son of a bitch, 90% of these guys did not have to die. You know, this guy did, you know, Sammy, take perfect example. You mentioned Sammy the Bull. Sammy the Bull was killing guys to take over their businesses, to take over their construction companies, to take over their control of a union. These guys aren't supposed to get killed. These guys, you're supposed to do business with them. So for me, I wanted to go out every day and make money. I wanted to, you know, I look, I'm doing violent crimes. I'm not saying I wasn't violent. I'm knocking off armored cars. I'm hijacking trucks. I'm doing everything I can. And it's all violent all violent, and eventually I'm charged with all that violence, so I get it. But I wasn't out there going every day, who can I kill, who can I kill? And I, I think a lot of these rats who tell, I killed five guys, I killed 10, I killed 20, I killed 30. I mean, these guys killed a small wedding party. How, you know, how many people can you kill? How many really had it coming? And I realized later that a lot of them didn't when I was in jail. And it made me rethink that whole mob thing because I'm saying, shit, I was in the middle of this. I was in a snake pit. I could have died in a, a split second by some jerk who wants to take maybe, you know, the, the, the money that I robbed yesterday. He's going to put a bullet in the back of my head and grab the, you know, the half a million dollars in cash that I just robbed from a truck yesterday. I didn't know that those people existed because I wasn't like them. So I was under the false impression, my immaturity, my naivety, whatever it was, I was under the false impression that if I was sitting at a table with 10 guys, they all thought like me. And I also thought we... They thought like me in the sense that everybody would be willing to go to jail because I was. I went to jail. Never snitched. Again, I'm the only guy who writes books, who hosts a television show on the other side who never snitched. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm proud to say that because I was, you know, I like these guys. You know, why go to the pen when you could send a friend? I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. You know, these are guys I broke bread with. These are guys who were in my house. I was in their house. I knew their mothers, their fathers, their wives. Ronnie Gialonzo. One, one of my dearest friends from childhood, who I love, a man of men, they don't make people like Ronnie. When I was, I was on the lamb, I was going on the lamb once, I went to Ronnie's house and I said, Ronnie, I oh, know I'm sorry, I knocked on the door. His mother answered. I said, uh, uh, Ms. G, is Ronnie home? I got to, I got to, I need him for something. I got to go on the lamb. She goes, what do you need him for? I go, I got a trunk load of guns in my trunk. She goes, hurry up, hurry up, bring them in. I mean, these are people I love. These are my, you know, she's looking to help me. This is a, you know, a woman who grew up in the life, by the way, um, but that's my family. I can't imagine ever giving them up, ratting on them after they did everything. To, and they helped me, too, in different ways, too, not just mob ways. You know, when I lost my mother, my mother died in my arms. I cried on these, these people's shoulders. You know, they, 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 they hugged me. There's, there's a human element to this, too. How do you just rat them out and send them all to jail and say, I want my, my freedom's worth more than theirs? So, I mean, I'm on my little thing with the rats right now. I don't mean to get that far off, but that's how I feel. Well, well, wasn't there an instance you said that someone you knew blowtorched someone's penis? Oh, that was, uh, that, well, that was, um, I think, Richie Pagliarulo. Yeah, I mean, I had nothing to do with that, but uh, it was somebody I was close with. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the situation you're talking about. Um, Richie was asked to kill an architect, uh, somebody who gave gas pipe Casso cash I mean, Gas Pipe Castle gave the guy money under the table. Um, I was removed from that. I had nothing to do with that, but I was close with the guy who did it. Um, you know, I look, I'm going to tell you, it's funny because I don't think in terms of like the way of, of think of people in, ter in the same way average citizens do. For example, I, Jimmy Coonan was, was a dear friend of mine. I loved Jimmy Coonan, boss of the Westies, the Irish godfather. We treated him like he was an Italian godfather. He earned that respect his whole life, and he was the gem of a man. I love Jimmy, like a father, incredible man. And Jimmy Coonan cut people up. You know, he chopped off heads, arms, legs. 
I think he brought somebody's head to a sit down in a bag. You know, I mean, this guy was off the charts crazy. But when I, you know, when I'm in conversation with somebody, I'll go, they'll say, yeah, did you know Jimmy? I'll say, Jimmy was a great guy. So one time I said it, you know, I was I was with uh, uh, my girlfriend and I said, you know, Jimmy was a great guy. She goes, how could you say he was a great guy? He cut somebody's head off. You know, so that's like totally different. I'm on a different wavelength. When you're in that world, in that life, you don't judge people for that. You judge people if he's going to cut my head off when I'm not looking. And Jimmy's the type of guy, unless you cross him, you could, you could put your trust in him for the rest of your life. Jimmy would never hurt you. Never. And he'll, he'll put his own life on the line to defend you if he has to. He's only going to chop you up or kill you or something if you double-crossed him or did something to him or threatened him or his family. So it's a different set of standards that we live by. I'm obviously a citizen today, so I could think straight. It's not like my mind is all muddled and I still believe these things. But, you know, like I said, I judge people differently. So Richie Pagliarulo, he might have cut somebody's penis off with a blowtorch, but I got to tell you, when I was leaving Lewisburg, Richie, Richie never used to come to the yard. Nobody ever used to see Richie in the yard. Richie's out the whole day in the yard. So I go, Richie, everybody's going, what are you doing out today, Richie? What are you doing out? So finally I go, Richie, go inside. What are you doing out all day? He goes, you're leaving here. I'm doing life. I'm going to die in here. I'm never going to see you again. He goes, I wanted to spend this last day with you. How, how do you not love a guy like that? You know, so, you know, I mean, I disassociate myself from the penis he cut off and the guy he killed. And, you know, and they even somebody even said Richie was in C block in Lewisburg. Uh, I said, why is he in C block? Apparently they only put like either. I think they used to put either active homosexuals or people who were mentally imbalanced in C block. That was sort of like where the prison used to, de you know, uh, uh, isolate those people in their own housing unit. So I said, why is Richie in C block? And somebody said, uh, Louis, you know, he tasted somebody's brains. So I said, what? He tasted somebody's brains? You're kidding me. Again, I saw him the next day. We ate together. You know, I, I put that out of my head. It's got nothing to do with me and him. So you have to realize, you know, it's a different, different viewpoint of people, different understanding of people than the average citizen might have. When people in John Gotti, when John Gotti went to trial, there was a tape of him going, I'll sever his, his MF and head off. I'll sever his MF and head off. John Gotti was a killer, but he wasn't severing people's heads off. It was just talk. But if a jury hears that, they're going to go, oh, wow, he's going to cut somebody's head off. It's John Gotti. He must be serious. But we know that Roy DeMeo would cut somebody's head off in a minute and roll it down a bowling alley. No problem. But John Gotti wasn't like that. John Gotti wasn't the type to cut somebody's head off. He's not getting in the tub with a, with a chainsaw. Tommy Karate, yes. Jimmy Coonan, yes. Roy DeMeo, yes. But we know who the guys are that do that. You know, we're familiar with them. And, and you know, you got to look over your shoulder once in a while if you're around those guys and you're not close to them because you never know when they catch a delusion and want to, you know, want to throw your head down an alleyway.